So I was born on July 4th, 1983, in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. It was America's 207th birthday, and it was my dad's 29th. The entire family on my mom's side had gathered at our farm in Maine for the holiday, and my mother, ever the optimist, had no idea just how impatient of a child I was going to be from the start. I came into this world a lot like the fireworks that are the hallmark of the holiday, which is like dramatically attention seeking and also just like super loud. A lot of the people that know me would say that I operate that way to this day. But my dad, he was my number one fan from day one. And he did his best to steer my undiagnosed ADHD towards the path of chaotic good by investing in every single one of my hobbies and trying to get me invested in his in some very two birds, one stone parenting energy. I make the best pancakes. I can drive a stick. I can make a hell of a dirty martini and I can grill absolutely anything on a charcoal Weber. And boats, like so much boat stuff. He wanted someone to be able to drive the boat for him to water ski, so he trained me. And he loved sailing, so to camp I went. And I know how to tie knots that I do not even know the names of. And I can fully rig and sail a sailboat all by myself. You know, truly marketable skills. He was obsessed with the rules of the ocean. And any time we got in a boat, he would say, red, right, returning. It was kind of the family mantra red, right, returning, every time you got in a boat. And it's just the short way of saying that the red buoy needs to be on your right when you are returning to the harbor so that you don't get hit head on by an outgoing yacht or swallowed into somebody's wake. He was winning the dad lottery. And I feel like I can encapsulate our mutual chaos in this short tangent. When I was 16 years old, they decided to buy me my first car. So dad and I went to look at a 1979 fire engine red Suburban that had a CB radio that had a speaker in the front grill. And we bought it on the spot. And when it inevitably blew up on the side of the road shortly after, there was like a short conversation about how we should get something more economical. And then we doubled down and put a rebuilt 454 and a sound system in it because you could fit 12 kids and a quarter keg in that thing. Allegedly, mom, allegedly. <laughs> then I went to the dark side of the moon, as teenage girls often do, and I became emotional and volatile, and I could slam the door off its hinges. And he met me at that energy every step of the way, because being the same is like, really great till it's not. <laughs> Luckily for him, I stabilized in my 20s when we mutually decided to not speak about the elephant in the room, which was that he absolutely hated every boyfriend and every fiance that I ever had. And at least now I know that he was right because yay therapy. <laughs> <laughs> He bit his tongue through fiance number one. Oh, they're numbered for ease of conversation in our family because there's so many. And then he doubled down on number two. I was with number two the Christmas that we found out that he was sick. And then for the next three years, our family was on a roller coaster of emotions. There were treatments with a few small wins and a, like a lot of big losses. On August 19th, 2018, at seven o'clock in the morning, I held my dad's hand with my mom at his home in Florida. And we said goodbye. We had sent my brother home the night before to finally get some rest, and even though he lived only five minutes away, he arrived just 
15 minutes too late. I will never forget the look on his face when I opened the door and he saw my expression. In fact, that whole day is seared deeply in my memory forever. It took us a whole year to figure out his end of life ceremony and even that felt like a vastly accelerated timeline. You see, in that year, I left fiance number two because I feel like it's a pretty good monitor of a person, how they support you in the worst trauma of your life, and I'm gonna keep it family friendly by saying he did not pass the test. Not even a little bit. My father's will reads verbatim, as close as you can get to a Viking funeral without getting arrested. And to please watch the 1988 film Rocket Gibraltar, which if you haven't seen it, is largely just a tutorial on how to have a Viking funeral. <laughs> you should watch it, it's a good movie. So we decided to have his memorial out at the Carroll family summer vacation spot, which is Fire Island, Davis Park to be exact, you have to take a ferry out there and then you walk everywhere by boardwalk. My dad was the oldest of 10 kids and I spent a lot of summers when I was little out there with his whole family. But at this particular point, I hadn't been there in almost 20 years. So we rented a house and we catered it ourselves and I made so many meatballs that I still cannot look at them to this day. We bought a tiny wooden Viking ship and we packed it with some of his ashes and then we asked everybody to write a little note to put inside of it during the cocktail hour, which in the Carroll family is any time you decide to start drinking before dinner. At sunset, we took the boat with the ashes and the notes and me, my mom, my brother Thomas, his girlfriend, and my emotional support animal and best friend, Kat, took that boat and walked it down at sunset to the end of the Bayside Boardwalk, and we waded out into the bay where Dad used to keep his sailboat. And in the first time ever since becoming my sibling, my little brother did the talking, and he gave a beautiful eulogy. And in Dad and I's spirit of mutual chaos, I made a giant homemade torch and I soaked it in lighter fluid and kerosene and I lit that boat on fire with purpose. We watched it burn all the way down until all that was left was a tiny piece of the boat and a bunch of ashes on the top of the water. And then we took that piece of boat and we buried it in the sand. And then all of us just stood there watching the rest of the sunset and we cried and we hugged each other. It was the most fitting end for the best kind of weirdo. Like the kind of weirdo that during the last few years of his life, his favorite song was What Does the Fox Say? <laughs> and he would play it so loud and so often that I guarantee you there's still people in that apartment building that are traumatized. I am the weirdo that I am today because of him. And I owe him my life. And I mean that literally because I was kind of a mess like long before he got sick. I repeated a lot of toxic cycles and I refused to deal with a lot of PTSD and trauma from events in my 20s. I was sad. I was pessimistic. I was really codependent. But the funny thing about going through the worst day of your life is that it kind of makes everything else pale in comparison, right? And it gives you this weird strength. Sometimes my mom still asks me how I can have any faith in anything because all we did was beg the universe to make him better. 
and he still died. And at least now, I have an answer for her. He died so that I could live. Because with, without that catalyst, the person that you see in front of you right now does not exist. She's just, she's not here. It was his final gift to me, was to allow me to live my life for happiness and to be authentic. To be truly myself. Sorry, I'm buffering. <laughs> oh, I used to call myself like a lot of mean names. I would say, I'm a shit magnet, I'm a dumpster fire, and I would like say it self-deprecatingly so that people would laugh, but also I kind of felt like it was true. And I don't say things like, to, like that to myself anymore at all, because since leaving fiance number three, <laughs> I'm happy. I do things in my life that bring me joy, and I have a fierce band of weirdos at my side, like a lot of whom are, are in this audience tonight supporting me. Because I am not a dumpster fire. If anything, I am a dumpster phoenix. Because I will rise from the ashes of that trash because I am red, I am right, and I am returning to myself. Thank you. Thank you.